Good morning. I'm happy to be here in Texas. I hear you guys like to do it big. <laughs> this is pretty cool. But teen pregnancy prevention as a poverty reduction strategy, that's pretty big also. So we're going to go ahead and get started. First, before I get started, can someone pull out their cell phone? I, I need help figuring this equation out. We got about 10 seconds. I'll wait. No? OK, I, I see some of you guys look a bit confused. But what if I told you that in less than 20 minutes, at least 80% of you will not only understand this equation, but you'll understand this linkage to teen pregnancy and poverty reduction? Would you believe me? Yes. Let's see. We're going to go all the way back. This is Vilfredo Pareto. Um, Pareto was an Italian economist who first noted the law of the vital few in 1896. He later created a mathematical formula to describe the unequal distribution of wealth in his country. Pareto observed that 20% of the individuals owned 80% of the wealth. Later, in 1940s, Dr. Joseph Duran used the formula and applied it to his work on industrial quality control. He then named it after Pareto, calling it the Pareto Principle. Since then, the more commonly known rule of 80-20 has been widely applied. So the rule of 80-20 simply means that the minor amount, there's a minor amount of inputs that usually accounts for the majority of the results. I'll give you an example. 20% of customers typically put in 80% of the complaints. <laughs> for those of you who work with staff, 20% of your staff are probably responsible for 80% of the sick days that are being used. I wonder if any of them are in here. <laughs> Let me put one that's a little bit more closer to this audience. From the recent edition, Winter 2016, of Philanthropy Magazine, even though roughly 80% of today's largest donors have publicly aspired to ambitious social change, only 20% of philanthropic investments over $10 million went to social change organizations. I'll give you one a little bit closer to me. In my dissertation studies, I actually used the formula to highlight the minor amount of core components and evidence-based programs that actually accounts for the results we see. So as you can see, there's an unlimited number of ways that you can apply this principle. The trick is we typically don't use that equation. It just naturally occurs. Well, let's see how the original application used by Pareto actually applies to the distribution of wealth here in the United States. Today, the United States, according to the Census Bureau, has a population of 326,189,056 individuals. Each one of these units you see up here, they represent roughly 3 million people. And as one of the wealthiest nations in the world, the United States has a net worth of $67 trillion. Each one of these units are worth about $670 billion. Take a look. As you can see, the top 1% of our population controls 35% of the wealth. The top 5% collectively owns 63% of the wealth. And when you look at the top 20% of the population, they control 89% of the wealth in the country. My esteemed colleagues, you know this. The American dream is getting harder to realize for many of us. And for those at the bottom 40%, the stark reality is 70% of those individuals will stay there indefinitely. 
Could it be worse? Yes. For historically marginalized people of color, particularly African Americans, the story is even bleaker. Nearly seven out of 10 black Americans born in the middle quintile will fall back to the bottom 40% by the time they reach adulthood. So the odds are quite low that a low-income child will rise to the middle class as an adult. For many of these individuals and across the generations of families, economic mobility is hampered by things like unstable families, poor education, a lack of educational opportunities and job opportunities, inadequate food, inadequate health care, inadequate housing. And teen pregnancies are often associated with lower educational outcomes and higher poverty rates for themselves as well as poor outcomes for their children. And these pregnancies typically happen in the midst of unstable relationships. And these parents have skills that are underdeveloped, which inhibits their mobility and cause the poverty to continue. But colleagues, even in the best of our world, a child born in the United States has a 7% chance that that child will grow up in poverty. When a child is born to a teen mother, it's 27% chance that that child will grow up in poverty. And if the parents are unmarried, it's a 42% chance that that child will grow up in poverty. And if the child is born to a teen mom who doesn't have a high school diploma, a GED, there's a 64% chance that that child will grow up in poverty. And these numbers are compounded when these factors are linked together. So a child born to a teen mom who is unmarried and does not have a high school diploma is nine times as likely to grow up in poverty than a child who is born to a mother who is married and has a high school diploma. But who cares? We do. Because poverty is both a cause and a consequence of teen pregnancy. And because we know the implications for these young families and the bad outcomes for these children. Because we know that just because a teen has an ability to physically bear a child, it does not equate to the emotional, social, social or economic capacity needed to successfully raise that child. And why should we care? Well, if you're like the mayor and your cause is education, you care because teen moms and children born to teen moms are more likely to drop out of high school. If you care about child welfare, you care because children of teen moms are more likely to experience abuse and neglect and enter the foster care system. You care because almost 50% of girls in foster care today will have a pregnancy by the age of 19. And we know that if we delay that pregnancy, the birth from 17 or earlier to 20 or 21, we reduce the foster care entry placement by 6%. If you care about juvenile justice or the penal system, you care because sons of teen moms will feed into the school to prison pipeline. If you care about public health, you care because children of teen parents are more likely to become teen parents, thereby continuing the cycle of poverty. So how can we support efforts to increase mobility from poverty? First, we must work within and across all of these issue areas. In fact, the U.S. Partnership on Mobility from Poverty lists pregnancy prevention as one of the 13 fundamental building blocks to move Americans out of poverty. Additionally, 
Bridgespan has identified teen pregnancy prevention as one of the $15 billion bets. They estimated that if we invest $1 billion, it will result in $3.2 to $6.4 billion worth of economic benefits for low-income individuals and families. So I'll stop and tell you a quick story. Recently, I traveled across the country and conducted a series of focus groups with expectant and parenting youth in foster care. And in addition to bonding and falling head over heels in love with these beautiful angels, I had an opportunity to witness and listen to a genuine display of love that these teen parents have for their babies. And at the same time, young mothers and young fathers in these focus groups consistently describe what I call passive pregnancies. I later picked up a copy of Isabel Saw Hill's Generation Unbound. Um, and in her rendition of the same phenomena, she called these young parents drifters. They're drifting into pregnancy and motherhood. But pulling from the behavioral economics, pulling from the field of behavioral economics, where the defaults matter in a big way, Sawhill cleverly suggests that we should change the default from getting pregnant, if you do little or nothing to prevent it, to not getting pregnant until you take deliberate steps to do so. It means that we now recognize that what people do in the heat of the moment is often at odds with their own longer-term welfare. We also know, adding to this rationale, that advances in neuroscience has brought more attention to the progression and duration of adolescent brain development, which lasts well into their 20s. We, understand, we better understand the impact that toxic stress has on the brain for those who are growing up in poverty and the impact that has on their executive functioning and decision making. So what does changing the default looks like? Think about this. What happens when employees are asked to sign up into a retirement plan? Nothing. <laughs> because they have to stop and actively think about what to give up, what to save, and how it's going to impact them today. But when employees are automatically enrolled in the retirement plan, and the option is they have to take action to unenroll, guess what happens? It skyrockets. I'll give you a simpler example. If I don't stock my pantry with junk food, I'm less likely to have middle of the night splurges and I'll have better outcomes on my diet, <laughs> right? So I know what you're thinking. What does her diet and lack of willpower have to do with this? Let's see if I can link the dots and bring us home. If knowledge is power, then one of the best strategies to increase educational, career, and mobility opportunities for low-income people today is to help them take advantage of their power, their power to choose if and when to start a family and make sure that they have the information and access they need to, to services to reduce any unplanned teen pregnancy. But I ask you again, who cares? We do. Because we, know, because we know all of this, we know that it is our collective responsibility and it's our collective contributions that will help to break the cycle of poverty. Who cares? We do. Because these young people here, they represent our future. And they should be given the tools to maximize their potential. And we know that just because they have a physical ability to bear a child, that they may not have the capacity to successfully raise that child. Who cares? We do. Because the reorganization of hormonal, anatomic and neuropsychological substrates of sex during early adolescence is profound. 
And this time period brings into play detailed and complex decisions and interactions about sex, sexual display, and sexual interaction. Who cares? Because every child deserves parents who not only love them, but parents who are prepared to rear them successfully. And every child deserves a safe and stable home and community to grow up in. And every child deserves an education that will prepare them for a job with livable wages so that they could realize their piece of the American dream. And every child deserves to be happy and healthy and have a chance for a brighter future. Who cares? You do. Because Texas is not just about doing it big. Texas is about getting it right. Thank you.